Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the Elevate podcast. I'm your host, Wasim. Uh, my guest today is someone really amazing. He's the CEO of Snowflakes Luxury Gelato. Uh, he, 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 I'm sure you've been to the Snowflakes Gelatos. There's lots all over London and now opening all over the world. Um, he tells the story of where he started, humble background, uh, you know, how he, he kind of graduated, found his purpose uh, in business and how he pursued that with uh, you know, real focus. Uh, he talks about something really interesting. He talks about his uh, desire for quality in, in, in his business and I think quality in his life um, and what he did to achieve that. Um, he is somebody who's now at a point of, of I think, amazing success and he's going on to a to kind of a, he's into a new phase of his life and he tells us a little bit about that as well. Um, so I'd like you all to welcome my guest today, Asad Khan, CEO of uh, Snowflakes Luxury Gelato. I hope you'll enjoy. Hi, Asad, how's it going? Wasim, I'm all good, all good, very well. Yourself? Very well, very well. So, uh, you know, it's my absolute pleasure to speak to you uh, this morning. It's very windy, so hopefully hopefully you can't hear that. Um, now, obviously, we go way back. We are we are Plumstead boys right from the start. Um, our families knew each other a long time ago. So it's an absolute pleasure to have you have you here and speaking to you uh, today. Um, so obviously, you, you know what we're going to be uh, speaking about here here on the on the podcast. Uh, I really want to get into your story and understand the journey that you took and the types of uh, actions, the types of thinking that you had to get you through that journey, to get you through the difficult times and the good times, um, and really bring out what people can also follow. Uh, I think that's that's the bit that I'm I'm really interested in. Uh, so tell us a bit about the beginning. W were you born in in Plumstead? I was born in Slough. But yeah, first of all, uh, yeah, thank you. The pleasure is mine. Thank you for having me on. And um, I, like I say, you can take the boy out of Plumstead, but you can't take the Plumstead no. out of the boy. <laughs> this <laughs> so, is true. So both you and I have Plumstead DNA coming through us. And uh, for those people who don't know where Plumstead is on the map, um, South East London. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an amazing place. You know, you should go. Yeah, there was an article in The Guardian a couple of years ago saying Plumstead Common was one of the most best places to live in London. Now, I'm not sure right. I agree with that. Or, or, like, okay. yeah, it's not becoming more. It was a popular place to live, um, but, um, but yeah. So uh, yeah. So I grew up in South East London. I mean, I was very young when my um, parents moved over to to Plumstead, and we were there primarily. You know, we moved over for for a business. My dad got a shop on the high street, and I grew up on top of the shop. So my my kind of earliest memories um, are of me. You know, going up the spiral metal staircase. You know, it was a spiral metal staircase on 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 the flat on top of the shop. We were about three families living there. Was that around uh, the back? Around the back, that's right, right. on Lake Road. So that was around the back when we were originally on the, on the left hand side of the store. And um, and then then we moved to above the store. And my memories then were of uh, you know actually right across from the fire fire brigade station. So yes. Uh, and when I was young, actually, I um, always had this dream of living out in the countryside with a big garden. And in the holidays, we go and see my cousins in Slough. Which is where I was born. A lot of the family still stayed in Slough, and they had a garden, and it felt like a different world because living on a flat on top of a shop, there's no garden, and um, you know the kind of the free space and the open space, it felt like you know a, a real, um, you know, a real exciting thing, a real adventure to, to be able to yeah. have, and a real, real, real luxury as well. So when I was younger, I was always had this, um, you know, I'd love to be living out in, in the country, and I, alhamdulillah, managed to 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 have that. Yeah. Lived in Hertfordshire for about seven, eight, about eight years. And we had a huge garden. Actually, I realised a big garden's not that good. And spend half a day, <laughs> more, right? You got to get a ride on. But uh, so, but, so uh, obviously, not everybody um, here will know Plumstead. But those of you who know Plumstead, and those of you, those of us who grew up in Plumstead, uh, Fine Ways Cash and Carry was the South Asian uh, place to to get everything right. We had we had meat, we had all of our spices and vegetables and all of that sort of stuff, and it was the place to go. Now, when you were growing up, did you feel that oh, okay, we're kind of quite central in this community? Because you know your family were very central, very central in the mosque, very central uh, a business, uh, and you know the, your 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 father and his brothers uh, and cousins, I believe, were all quite kind of central figures. You know, my my. My dad and brothers and, and mum and everybody knew you guys from from that central part of the community. Did that? Did, did you become aware of that when you were when you were small? How did Fine Ways make it onto the agenda today? <laughs> Listen, Fine Ways is absolutely critical. It's it's <laughs> I, I I believe it's the start of the story. 
both of you. Yeah, no, I mean, um, at, so it's at school. It was like you know, I was the dad. I was the one whose dad had had the shop, right? And um, you know, some of the, some of the we were one store away from the corner, but I was I was teased by some of the kids <laughs> by saying, "Yeah, your dad's got a corner shop." Right. No, I kept on arguing with them. No, no, it's one store away from the corner. It's, yeah. Fair enough. It wasn't on the corner. Uh, and um, but yeah, I, I think it was it was quite for me. It was really nice growing up in the store. The, the positive sides were I really got comfortable and confident quickly with dealing with with um, customers, with um, you know, strangers, people coming in, and then with the local community. Um, you know, the, the 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 ladies down the road coming in for the yam and planting and. Yeah, or, or yeah, yeah. you know the aunties coming in for the subsidy or whatever it might be people yeah. are coming in and out the shop for and like after school when i was a bit older I, i'd you know stop in and allow dad or um, my cousin to have their tea break and uh, help out in the summer holidays we'd love stacking shelves and have uh, have good fun um you know, going out to the spitfields market early morning and um you know getting the fruit seeing how it's all done so that was for me i think some really good learnings there which i didn't at that time kind of process consciously mm. oh this is really good learning i was just thinking all right this is, this is life right this is my dad's got a shop and this is what i'm going yeah. to do uh, but one thing that was instilled on me that my dad was quite um insistent on from that age was like you know i want you to educate yourself and 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 you know qualify in, in a profession of sorts you know yeah. he, choose your profession you know he gave a few options you know accountancy being one of them and he said look what, what do you think about this and he was really quite insistent on rather than bringing me into the family business actually like, keeping away from the family business after you know uh, when i was getting to university age and so on so look why don't you focus on your studies and um you know make your own career you don't need to be part of the family mm. business and he's actually quite creates a bit of a distance rather than saying look come into the family business and grow it and think about how you can partake in it he actually was was the opposite saying like actually you know for, for all of us all all this all of his children my siblings were saying look do you know get yourself educated and i think which is a lot of um families from 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 you know from pakistan whose parents have come over they wore you know especially in london and so on in the south you know, the parents were insisting on a really good education and they you know belief is good education is a good ticket out to get a profession and get stability yeah. and so on, so on. And, and, and that's so. definitely kind of the south asian narrative especially people of our age um where parents went, look, we have to do certain things to survive and to bring you guys up. We don't want that for you. We want you to move up into the next social strata to some extent. Um, and obviously so social and financial strata. And I think that had its positives and its maybe not negatives, but it had it had other effects as well. So so did you feel that did you did that sit with you? Did you want to go right? I'm, I'm, I don't want to be involved with the shop. I want to do or I don't want to be involved with business. I want to do kind of professional or because you ended up, you know, running a business, a very, a very successful business. Um, so do you feel like. Do you have that those conversations now with your parents and go, actually, that was really good for me, the final experience? Yeah, I think I think um, for me. At the time, it wasn't uh, an imposed instruction of like, you, you've got to do this. It was a suggestion. Right. Look, why don't you think about this, you know, mm. and you know this is a good avenue to go why don't you explore it more and uh, for me i was quite open to it i was into you know i, I did economics at, uh, you know, at university and i was quite into to business and so on and, and you know for me getting into the accounting profession was like all right that's the next thing i wasn't you know, thinking my career is going to go in this this way i just felt okay let's get a, let's get a, let's get the degree done go to a nice city where you know make some good friends yeah. good, good degree and i was quite comfortable with with, with all of that and, and quite comfortable doing the the professional exams and i knew that Back then, if I have a qualification, that's, you know, for me it was finance um, in accounting, that would really help me um, stand out from just being a graduate. You know, right. uh, you right. know I graduated, I don't know, applied for two, three hundred jobs, and back then it wasn't CVs being emailed; it was like you know, letters oh, yeah. written out, they were posted, and so on. And um, you know, so um, this is back in the you know, graduated in '97. So you know, for me, it was just the natural course of things, right? And I, mm. when I look back, I think it was brilliant. Everything that's happened happened for a reason and it allowed me to be where I am today. Uh, and it's all part of the learnings. It's all part of what we're what we're here for. So, yeah. so for me, yeah. I go back thinking I, I could have done something different or, you know, be involved in business. No, it's, I think everything panned out um, just perfectly, right? It's just, it's yeah. just so so in in so above fine ways, it was you and your and your siblings, but there were your cousins were there as well, right? No, initially, I mean, when I was really young, we were sharing one of the flats, but then we, we managed to get um, a flat to ourselves and then we managed to move right. by time about 10 right. into a proper house with a, with a garden. So, you know, I think you know, for the first, you know, of my conscious kind of awareness uh, from about the age of four or five 
till about 10 11 yeah, we were in the flat and then after that we were, we were in the house alhamdulillah and then so so yeah we, we um yeah we did initially live with an extended family kind of wider family yeah but yeah. Yeah, that was when i was very very young and yeah um, and then you know we we, we all how our business was good and we all managed to get houses right, like, right. All, all in bumps it but uh, yeah 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 so I think I think one thing that you you said I I just want to p pick up on real quickly, um, the idea of working in a shop. So I worked in a shop. I worked up in, in a shop just up the road from Highways. I worked in Woolworths. Woolworths was my first job, and you're exactly right. You're 100. percent I would encourage any young person to go get a job in a shop, because it teaches you exactly those things. It teaches you to deal with people, to deal with happy people, with angry people, with upset people. It gets you out doing things with your grind with your hands i think it's it's a fundamental experience of business and life um so i think i think there's definitely something to be said for for you know just being outside of your house outside of your comfort zone there's no one there to really look after you so your manager or someone tells you what to do your dad, in your case probably your dad or or uncles told you what to do and you got on with it right and and i think that experience is is brilliant and I think you know any any 14 or 15 year old as soon as you can in the UK I think the age of 16 get a job uh, you know in a shop in a supermarket in, in something which is a service industry because it's very good for you you don't have to do it for long maybe only maybe only a year but it's a, it's a really good experience it really yeah, gets absolutely there. actually I remember after my um, GCSEs um, along with a few other friends filling out holiday CVs and dropping off to Selfridges and to Harvey Nichols they were like right. team jobs for us back in the you know yeah um, yeah, yeah been in the summer and I could get a job there or that'd be incredible and just getting the rejections and rejections and, and you know it was like well fair enough but um you know, went back to find ways you know and uh <laughs> you know, always had a job there right so uh it's no pay but something to do but you're, you're spot on I think a retail as an environment is brilliant You've got people coming in off the street of all different backgrounds different mindsets or different moods at a time and it's just how you engage with them and, and, yeah, and yeah, yeah. Uh, interpersonal skills you just pick up from being you know uh, in a retail environment are brilliant they're really you get brilliant. to know different people right so like you say you know you mentioned the the yams and the plantain because there's 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 a certain community that's interested in that kind of food but you wouldn't know that unless you were in that place right so you get to know people and what they're about and what they think and what they you know how they interact and you don't get that if you're just sitting in front of your computer all day so i think there's definitely uh, we we are definitely advocating that how was school for you what did you enjoy in school Schools, uh, schools are all right. I mean, um, where did you go, Polly? I went to Woolwich Polytechnic. That's right. right. So, so grew up. Uh, we went to Conway and Woolwich Polytechnic. Um, I wasn't academic type, right? So I didn't, I didn't come out with uh, a whole string of uh, A's for my GCSEs. But oh. I think, I, you know, you all know Woolwich Polytechnic. I was one of the only five other children in the whole year who managed to get, you know, five um, or more. GCSEs with you know, so you're plus grade. So there's very few people who actually came out of British Polytechnic that year who who um you know who academically did excelled. It wasn't known for its um academic uh, academic uh, yeah. excellence as it was. So it was, it was fun. It was it was school uh, and and it was you know it was what I did then and um right. you know I, I um you know I but that's all. Let's try to get you into the well, private schools, Colfs, and I didn't get through the exams. And um, yeah, we tried a few years later with St Dunstan's, but the gap widened because you know two years in poly and you're not going to get oh, saved. Yeah. So you know, it, it, for me, I wasn't. My dad was saying, "Look, we're just getting into a better school," and I was okay. But we'll, we'll, we'll try. But it wasn't for me that the be all and end all. That's something right. Just, just it's all right. Don't worry. Yeah. So, but, and then, and where did you go uni? Went to Cardiff University. So really, so, okay, that's interesting. So how was your time in Cardiff? What was that like? It was great three years and um you know, did it did uh, economics and accounting so and um you know it was it was a time for me to you know be responsible for myself right you know, which is a great kind of i think you know it's a right of passage for for most kids these days get leaving the home and be able to cook for yourself and be able to but now they they order the uber in right uber eats or deliver <laughs> so. yeah 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 but it, you know, for me it was it was um you know a great time to to develop and, and get out and Again, just be on your own and, and uh, making friends from different parts of the world. You know, we make some really great Spanish friends and some 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 great friends who are very close to to this day. So it was a great experience. I think the the social element, the learning about myself element, and and the academic side all, all added up to to create a great three years there. So and what were some of the key things that you took away? You feel from from that time at university, uh, apart from obviously you know the friendships and and the education. Did you feel that there were 
practices that you came up with at university or that you found at university that helped you further down or do you feel like you were still developing? Oh, I was developing. Didn't have a clue about life. <laughs> <laughs> Not sure I mean, still, but, but, um, but yeah, it was very much developing. And I think yeah, for me, it's it's like, you know, I've got a, um, you know, I've got the uh, opportunity to, to mentor some 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 graduates and some people just, you know, some young youngsters in the community who either graduating or, or, or about to graduate or their first or second job and, um, you know, in their early 20s. And I think you know, now that that generation that's coming out from university now have got so much more opportunity in terms of role models, in terms of direction, in terms of, you know, um, you know, structured paths of, of, of growth and, and um, you know, with um, people in great great roles within 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 the within society right so you know the, the mayor of london right so Khan, can you know mm. for, from from uh, from from that to, to you know famous entrepreneurs to uh, you know people like james Hahn, right dragon's den yeah. and other people who are you know same background to us and we're thinking wow you know we've got these role models so so these guys now growing up have got i think a lot more uh, opportunities really to tap into that mm. um, you know, for, for me, coming out of university, you know, the whole thing around, you know, knowing myself or developing or, you know, was all a bit of, um, you know, all, all a bit of a mystery and then an unknown. It was just right. Let's just do what you do and just go out yeah. and you know, get a job and just do this and do that. And then I started just coming across some 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 inspirational speakers saying, oh, yeah, this guy's really good, knows what he's talking about. Uh, and, um, you know, then just pick it up and you think you have an interest in developing yourself. So I always had this interest in developing myself, developing my potential of who I am. And that's something that's kind of um, helped me get to, to where I am today, really. Yeah, yeah, OK. And then when you came from university, what was the first job that you went to? I was, did you come back home? Did you come from Cardiff? Did you come back to... to yeah, yeah. I, I came back um, and uh, moved back in the family house. And um, it was a, a role with uh, Canon. So uh, as, a, Ooh, as okay. a graduate finance role, so moving between departments and the finance departments. So, um, you know, tax and treasury and financial accounting and so on and so forth. So. And a great three three or four years I did there, so that was really good. Where was that based here in London? Well, based in Surrey, so based there. Right, Surrey. okay. Right, right, right. And so you were there for three years, and then and then where did you go from there? So from there, I just you know I, some of the projects I was working on towards the end of my um, stint there were on software and I and I right. had, um, analytical software, and um, I, I felt I really enjoy working with software. Mm. I'd love to do more of this and. Um, you know, back then I didn't kind of you know I was working in the finance department financial reporting analysis and so on and right. there was a new kind of um, genre of software coming out for financial reporting analysis kind of you know budgeting or performance management you know financial performance management people call it different things business performance management and I felt actually this is where I want to go into more and more you know software and finance you know yeah really you know, so I then reached out to a recruitment consultant um I said look you know I'd like to develop my career more in the software side and I was then Put to a couple of different roles and one was with British Airways and offered a role more kind of um, more position management accounting role but within you know, the IT departments managing their budgets capex and, and all that kind of stuff right. and the other one was with a small company called Comshare they've been bought out since and part of a bigger group now uh, but American-based company called Comshare and mm -hmm. um, you know it was for a role called a pre-sales consultant I didn't have a clue what a pre-sales consultant was <laughs> Well, I took, the, took the, the the opportunity to go in and be interviewed, and then I, um, you know, they invited me around for the second interview. I had to present to the, the whole sales team and so on, and um, you know, I got some great advice from my really good friend, Asad Ahmed, who was back then a presenter as well. So I said, look, help me get right. my presentation skills right. So I yeah. them, I was and presented really well. Um, but you know, interestingly, one of the questions in the interview was like, you know, pre-sales where you're starting, and now, you know, where would you, where do you see your career growing? And I stupidly answered, um, at some stage, I'd like to become a real consultant, right? <laughs> Thinking pre-sales wasn't real, you know, uh, and uh, whereas like, you know, he, he then explained to me, often consultants move into pre-sales once they've done so many years of consulting, because right. it's you know, the higher end of, of, of consulting. But with me, this word pre-sales, it was like, I didn't quite get it. I right. didn't realise it's the consultant aiding the sales guy. Yeah. So for those who don't know what pre-sales consulting is, it's, you have consulting doing the implementation of a project. So yeah you've got a project like SAP or software or anything and, and you've got the consultants delivering that right so they're delivering that that uh, that project and you've got um, you know the consultants who are part of the process we're helping the sale happen and the sale is the most important thing you don't get the sale you don't get the implementation so the, they, they take the best pick of the consultants for the sales side to then go out and, and you know help the sales team present articulate yeah. 
proof of concept. The benefits. You know, yeah. Business funding houses. You've got to think really quickly, and you've got to think on your feet, and you've got to come up with solutions really quickly. You know, literally on your feet. Sometimes presenting to audiences and so on. So I was I was in pre-sales consulting for a number of years. I loved it. Really did. You know, um, I just you know, it was like for me, perfect job. Lots of presentations. Didn't have to worry about implementing. So I'm not a starter finisher. I love starting yeah, 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 yeah. You know, proof of concept. I love engaging with with people, seeing different, so many different businesses. I've managed to go out and see because I was just doing proof of concept, proof of concept, move on. I wasn't stuck in one industry or one right. company for two, three years doing consulting. So I was getting, uh, you know, access to m much more senior people um, from my kind of age and let's say for you know just recently qualified as an accountant. I was dealing with you know head of finance, head of IT, and yeah, right. looking at big, big um, procurement projects around their software, software selection. And um, yeah, it was a great, great time there. And then after that, I actually didn't apply for another job again. I was just referred or moved on with salespeople and, and just, you know, it was more, there's no kind of applic applying for jobs. It was more my, my network and, uh, and moving w w along with them. Um, as that pre-sales uh, consultant, as you say, the, the presentation aspect was key. What how did you start off when you did your first presentations? What did you learn by people like Asad Ahmed um, and, and you know, through your own experience? How did you hone your presentation skills? What was the key thing for you? I think with presentation, it's being able to um, you know, compose yourself, have, have you know, uh, a grounded presence, uh, be relaxed, and then right. being able to, to, to you know, articulate in a, in a, in a succinct, way what it is you want to get across uh, and engage with the audience yeah and you know selecting to have you know eye contact for an you know for, for for a moment you know mm. how many seconds you know at least seven eight seconds per person and actually talking to an individual as if they are the audience and then moving the arm so making people feel really involved that you are that you are you know communicating connecting with them on that one-to-one -one basis mm. so for me, I, yeah i really enjoyed it i, mean, I think for me the 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 highlight of my career at that point was being flown out to, to New York for a presentation to the financial controls of WPP. So right. that's a financial control small all, all around the world for one of their annual kickoffs. And it was in the Meridian Hotel in New York, New York Times Square. And we were looking at New York Times Square and my slot was on and I was presenting uh, you know, the software. So I had to get everything you know, with pre-sales. You've got to get the software right. Yeah. You know, connect, you know, all these kind of things connecting to the projector and there's so many things going on. I remember on the plane over upgrading some of the software versions because there's something else going on. And it was, like, <laughs> and you're thinking, I hope this works, right? And you land and you make, you're doing some trial runs and um, you, know, you want to make sure in front of a big audience it all goes well, but then you're also you're presenting, you're talking and you're also showing software. And um, so I was there, 30, 30 plus people, financial controllers of WPP, and um, you know, the, the, the room was filled with, with probably more than 30 people plus their, 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 some of their teams. And, um, you know, it was kind of evening time, so dinner was brought on. And I saw, you know, starters being served out. And, um, you know, the one thing I really um, was pleased about that I didn't hear a single knife move or single fork move until I finished my presentation, which for me was brilliant. Yeah. Starters had been served and they could have just t stuck in stars while listening stuck to in. me. Yeah, yeah to capture their, their 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 attention and hold their attention throughout my presentation which for me i thought yeah that's that was quite nice and yeah. uh being able to do that you know um it's always a bit glamorous being able to present in new york right being in london yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and um so that was great you know as part of that role i did travel a bit um mainly uk based but yeah. travel to back and forth us us based company so lots of time in vegas with kickoffs lots of time in hq uh and your kickoff firstly it was um ann arbor but then, um, and then, um, in terms of from a business perspective, I did support some 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 uh, business development in, in in Europe and in the Middle East as well, which was all, all good fun. And and so I've I've done some of this as well. What do you feel you learn from working from different communities across the world? Right. So Americans are very different from from Europeans. What works in America doesn't necessarily work in Europe. Um, how did you find adapting to that different way of kind of presenting and working and thinking? Do you feel like it was natural or did you did it take you a minute? I think for me, what what came through for me was um, being um, having integrity, right? And, ha and being congruent and being aligned to, to what I'm here for. And as long as I keep that intact, then that's what they'll take from me being there. I don't, I didn't, you know, make sure you know, if I'm presenting to non, 
um, uh, native English speaking audience slow down, you know, right. go, go over things yeah. slower, and you know, just just give some more pauses and some more breaks. But otherwise, you know, for me, it was just be who you are and be the best version of who you are, mm. and um, you know, that will work, right? If you do that mm. well, and um, you can resonate well with people, um, you know. It, in the software game when we were selling, you know, in any, any any industry, we always say people buy from people. Yeah, true. Okay, so you might have a brand that you might have in mind as like the software or I said, yeah, so software back back for me then, you know, the biggest time, you know, the, the biggest deals I was working on was when I was at SAP, and it was either SAP or Oracle, right? So, right. so which, you know, that was the, the the market leaders, and often you know we're up against Oracle, but people weren't necessarily aligned to brands per se. They might have had a certain you know, um, software that they're currently using, but um, but you know it's all about the relationship, right? And people mm. buy from people. Mm, mm, mm. So it's now kind of what five six years after after university has finished. Are you getting the pressure f at home to get married, etc.? Oh, that, yeah, you're too late, man. <laughs> oh, you're already married. Okay. Okay. So I, I, as soon as I qualified as an accountant, my mind kind of clocked in. Uh, yeah, yeah, done. And uh, let's, you yeah, know, let's get going. So, um, so I, I got married at the age of twenty-five. Right. And, okay. Uh, so I got married at the age of twenty-five, and um, my lovely wife Shakira, and uh, we're alhamdulillah, still, still, still together. And um, we've got three, three lovely children. Oldest Ibrahim, uh, who's twenty. Um, then Abdurrahman, he is 18 or 17, going to be 18 this year. And Mariam, who's in, in, with me, in the office today, is half term. And some of the kids playing with her cousins as well. Uh, so, so um, it's been 20 years almost. It's been 20 it's years. 22 years this 22 years. Wow. So give us give us your input. What's the secret of uh, a happy, happy marriage? What what what's kept your relationship so strong, Alhamdulillah? Um, I think be ready for ups and downs and be accepting that life isn't, you know, one long honeymoon, right? There's, there's, yeah. everyone has their own um, experience in life and everyone's seeing the vision of their life through their own lenses, right? So right. perspective I'm seeing is my perspective from where I'm sitting, perspective that, uh, you know, Shakira was seeing is from her, her perspective from where she's sitting. And, you know, when, when I can appreciate and, and accept someone else's perspective being different to mine, Mm. That I can start being a bit more understanding and have like empathy and through empathy, understanding and through that connection. Because if you don't feel understood or, or you, know, you can't connect. So for me, it's like just understanding it as a mindset. Often we go around and we have this approach whereby my point of view or my perspective is the gold standard, right? Right. And everyone yeah. else is right. right. It's fine, right? Because my, it's my opinion or my point of view or my perspective is going to be the right one. And right. not everyone else is wrong, but they're not, it's not my they're perspective. Not, they're not my, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, not, it's not as good as mine. Now, you know, every single individual around the world is thinking the same thing, that thing, right? Yeah. My perspective is the right one. We wouldn't necessarily narrowly, naturally think, I've probably got this all wrong, right? We, yeah, we have yeah. this innate thing within us. We think that yeah, we, now, when we accept that actually there might be another way of looking at things, when we yeah. accept, you can open our mind to understand that everyone will have a different perspective. Everyone's, um, you know, background, you know, you know, the, the way the mind's thinking, uh, the, the neurons that are firing and wiring and all the different things that are going on in, in, in a person's head might be slightly different to mine. Right. But I accept, okay, there's going to be a different point of view. And from there, you know, allowing us to have some space, allowing, allowing, um, you know, that, that, um, allowing for being gracious if someone is falling from grace. Right. 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 Was really was with me, uh, um, you know, so if I'm, if I'm being right, you know, uh, idiot, <laughs> uh, you know, she, she, you know, having grace for me and uh, allowing me to that space, saying like he's being better than not, right? Like he's being, an yeah. idiot. and she wasn't judging me for it. It wasn't being, you know, um, you know. And when we were young, we were trying to figure that out. We were trying to find out. You know, we were trying to work out what what we wanted in our lives, let alone what someone else wants in their lives, right? Right. And um, you know, as I, some of you know, you know, the the younger kids in, in, in the family, you know, young adults, and coming into their thirties and so on. Their dad is saying, look, you know, we need to get them married off. And once they get married off, all their problems will be fixed. I said, no, 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 stop. No, no, yeah. You know, you, you fix your problems where you are. Nothing outside of you will fix your problems. That's the thing in relationships. A lot of people walk around as, you know, they're, they're, they're half, you know, they're half complete and they're looking for someone else. Right. To complete them. And you've got to be whole and full yourself and find someone else whole and full to feel fully you know, connected as two people. If you're waiting for someone else to come to fill that void, 
then that void won't be filled. You know, I'm sorry to say, but it's it's not. I can not, agree with you more. That's right. I, I think there's two things there. There's 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 one which is you need to be whole yourself. I think the other thing, which is probably one step below that, more foundational, is you need to know yourself. And we don't, right? Especially you know, as a 25 year old, um, people don't know themselves, right? We don't really know who we are, what we want what we'll take, what we won't take, what will agitate us, what will make us happy. You don't really know these things unless you stop and think, really deeply think about, hold on a second, who am I? What do I need? And how do I make sure that I'm not gonna sacrifice that for being quick or doing something that somebody else wants me to do? And we have all these pressures from parents and, and society to go, you need to get married, you know, you're 25, you need to get married, or you're 26, you're 27 or 35 or whatever. But actually, you're probably going to be happier and, and better as a, as a husband or wife if you actually know who you are and what you want and know that to be able to give to somebody else, you're going to have to receive. You know, it's a, it's a two way thing. Yeah. And I think that that's absolutely foundational. That's such a good point because you you're not going to be happy unless you have that. Uh, you know, you're really not. Um, and, you know, you've got what, three kids now, Ashella? Yeah, three children. And give us some tips. What, 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 uh, what's it like being a father of three kids? It's a slightly silly question because I know, but some of our listeners might not. <laughs> Absolutely. No, it's a very silly question, right? So um, it's, it's a challenging, rewarding, fulfilling. It's, it's a learning process. And you know, for me, it's a continual learning process. And, and for me, it's, I wish I knew some of the things I know now, back, you know, when I was 26, 27, when Ibrahim was, was, was young. And, and right. uh, you know, and, and, and the main thing is that, you know, when we love unconditionally and, and um, you know, when we truly love unconditionally, then, you know, we are um, able to, to nurture our children into an environment mm. where they feel they're being loved unconditionally, they're not being judged, they're not being compared to, and they flourish so yeah. much more than, than, than children who, who haven't had the opportunity, who've maybe been challenged a bit more from a younger age, um, you know, and so on. So for, for me, it's, um, you know, we, you know, Shark and I used to pick up books around better parenting and better this, right. better that. and the best better parenting advice I can give is be a better you. Right. Look to be a better parent. Uh, look to be better you look to see how you react you respond your emotions your thoughts you know what triggers you how, how can you manage to stay calm and present how can you be more loving just work on you right yeah you work on you you'll naturally become a better parent but understanding what what your you know what your um weaknesses are uh, and which areas of um lack of um lack of i suppose you know confidence in certain areas or, or certain, you know, fears, you know, and and, and, I, and I think in our you know, community of South Asians and in the UK, there's a lot of right, how's so and so doing? How's so and so? A lot of judging. Right, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, the academic ladder. Where are you on the on the spiritual ladder? Where you are on the you know, yeah. ladder, where, you know, and on on the you know activities after school ladder, and you know, all these things that need to be done by the children. It's like you know, and then like there's everyone you know in the in the community around me, you know. Um, watching and judging and that's my perception and then like based on that I'm responding to what I think the environment is asking me to do which is like you know be the best performer and perform and make right. sure kids do all this stuff and make sure they get really good education make sure they do all this and you know all that kind of stuff and um you know for, for me it was a lot of learning along the way um you know we 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 um we moved for our children to be in, in, in an Islamic based school in, in Hounslow mm. so we moved uh, we finally escaped Right. Um, back then it was Shooter's Hill, managed to get our plums did. But we moved from Shooter's Hill to be, to be in um, Twickenham where I lived and the children went to school in Hounslow for a while. And we decided one day just to, to pull out that school because we felt we want to go with uh, like-minded parents and a lot of the parents were like-minded and, and, you know, progressive thinking, but have that community and that culture around, you know, God-centered approach, faith-based approach to, 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 to the children understanding and, and knowing that, you know, there is one God and, and as a community, feeling comfortable with our faith and not having to feel like, you know, when I was growing up at school, for example, being one of maybe only two or three uh, Muslim kids in the class. So we felt that environment would be really good for them. The day decide, we decided to, to pull the children out was when when when, when um, the, um, Abdul Rahman was pulled up in class and the teacher said, you know, um, we had a meeting with the teacher. And they said, look, you know, 
he's going to be he's going to grow up to become you know x y and z goodness me he's so naughty in class you mm. know god only knows what he's going to do when he gets older and we, that day we made the decision this isn't the right place for us for mm. our children you know you don't you don't um, want that judgment you don't want that yeah, he's, that plan, he's already written off his future he said like you yeah. know gonna, god knows what he's going to do you know good luck to you all and um you know, we then you know, had a, a deep think about where we're going to go next and we took the children to a steiner school in, in king's langley so we moved from from um you know, twickenham to, to king's langley uh, we didn't have a, a single friend in King's Langley. We didn't have anyone. We knew that area. Um, we didn't know anyone in the school. What's, um, what's a Steiner school? So Steiner school is a school there. There is it's by a guy called Rudolf Steiner. He is right. uh, like a um, last century German, um, I think, kind of philosopher and educationalist. And um, some of his beliefs are a bit way out there. But yeah, the schools in, right. in themselves, what they do is they their strap line is education for the head, heart and hands. So right. similar to Montessori, at the younger age, they don't do formal learning, reading and writing. So Miriam got right. to experience that from, from the nursery. So Miriam's nursery wasn't any writing or reading, um, all the way through to she was, I think, or six or even seven. Right. They were out playing in the fields that learning, um, you know, learning how to plant seeds, how to, you know, um, right. yeah. and, and you know, the, the grounds of the school were huge. You know, enormous grounds where they had a farm, they had some bees, right. and they learned, you know, um, pottery that are woodwork and they yeah at a young age really learning and yeah, it really was truly education for the you know the heart hands and the mind and uh, you know not just focused on academic you know excellence so for us that was a great great experience mm. and course, experience we, we realized that that you know um uh, the, the middle son had had some some challenges that he needed like you know dyslexia and some more more learning support we needed so from there we really learned okay we now need to start spending some more time and helping him um, hone in on his on his needs and on his requirements and um you know often i think you know for for for, for when i was growing up you know talking about anything around you know a learning difficulty or oh, yeah. You know, uh, it, was, it, was all, it was all like, yeah, oh no, that, that's, yeah. you can't talk about that. You know, it was just, um, it was a, a taboo, right? Anything around mental well being and, and wellness yeah. was like, you know, yeah, just, you know, a couple of slaps and you'll be okay. Or, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, 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 you know, they're just slow or they're just, you know, certain labels would give, would be given. Right. You know, so and so is just slow or they're just, you know, not, and that's not right. It's like, you know, you can understand what, what was the need for that child. You know, have they got dyslexia. Have they got something else? Have they got another? Um, you know, is their part of their brain more active than another part of their brain? And, and with um, the the you know, his part of the brain which was around um, problem solving, um, puzzles, and and looking at um, you know um, uh, images to 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 you know um, solve the problems that you know um, mapping out the, the 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 lines and so on, mm -hmm. and this whole um, you know, looking at patterns. You know, a geometric, geometric, geometric and pattern recognition. He was in the top five percent of children two age, two two years older than him. Wow! Right? So his ability to recognise patterns and, and and this whole kind of you know was really really incredible. This whole kind of you know right. uh, you know looking at looking at patterns, looking at um, you know, graphics and, and and geometry. Whereas in understanding both spoken and writing and listening to languages. You know, be it English, French, or whatever it might be, was in the bottom five percent. You know, so his mind was one part was so excellent in terms of how it could do. Yeah, so strong. And the other part, it couldn't cope. Now, you know, but we managed to bring up that part. You know, through the right educational support. Right. To make make sure he's got what he needs. And I felt for us moving um, to to King's Lang that time was probably the best thing we did because we felt actually, you know, well, it's more around the you know the the the, the ability to recognise what does each child need individually. Yeah. What like for them, uh, you know, not having the same brush for, for for everyone, the same approach for everyone, and giving them that time to to really be be given the right support. You know, we we, we wore you know, one of the very few Asian families in the whole village. You know, <laughs> one or two others, and we got some the Asian, the Asian family in the, in the village. A similar similar guy, similar coloured person to me, like oh, run over and hug them. You know, it's like a handful of families. <laughs> but it was it was um, you know, but as a a lot of people moved to King's Langley for that Steiner school for the very yeah. reasons they wanted the best for their children, and it wasn't necessarily from a p p place of, of um, you know, you know, high performing academic um, schools in the in the in the, you know, in the in the private school space around competitiveness and like you know absolutely you know, doing you know more than and better than. It was more of a lovely community where you know, kind of let's say tree hugging type, you know, people more yeah. you know, spiritually oriented and and had more of. Um, you know, I think more of, of, a, of a focus around community being important 
um, you know, um, and the small things like just getting together and sitting down and as uh, you know, just spending time with people being important and, and you know, valuing each other and not, not judging each other. So I felt from that perspective, we felt very welcomed in that in that community. It was a really good time for us. Actually, so, there, so your um, youngest, uh, Mariam, she started off from there from her yeah, first school. She went, the system. She went through the from nursery um, and then, you know, when, when she was. Um, when we moved back to South East London, she was, um, I think, 11. So she started secondary school in South East London. So. Right. And and did she see the benefits of that? Or do you see the benefits of the kind of the education being uh, in a different mode up until six or seven? Because it's yeah. very interesting. So you, you might know this, but, but you know, um, there is uh, a one of the first caliphs of Islam, um, Hazrat Ali. He has a, a saying attributed to him to say, which is for the first seven years, let your children play. Which I, I find really interesting from from what you're saying. If this Rudolf Steiner guy is 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 uh, coming up with a similar conclusion, and I'm wondering what the what you saw different about kind of the way the money was because of the the, the letting her play or, or the different mode of education, which was less about the written and uh, written word. Did you see any differences? Did you feel any differences? No, absolutely. In terms of um, being. When you expose children to, so a lot of it comes back down to um, growth stages of human beings. Mm. Okay? And, and, you know, and, and, and a beautiful quote there from, from Azdalio that love them and let them play from the first. You know, yeah. Um, yeah, just, yeah. And then she goes on from there because it says for the second seven years, educate them. Yeah. For the, the, the third seven years, befriend them. Yeah. And that's Which is beautiful. Right? Because so. it's saying, look, when, you're, when they're 14, you can't really be a demanding, yeah. harsh kind of taskmaster yeah. you have to befriend them then because they're, they're too old to be yeah. you know, so, them in that same way when um when children are really young from from kind of naught to two their brainwave is in a state which is theta or delta it's a really slow yeah. brainwave state it's delta when you're sleeping theta is really really slow slow brainwave state and a hypnotic state really really relaxed deep state and then from two to about eight they're in mainly a brainwave state called alpha okay and alpha is a slower brainwave state um uh, to, to what the mo most people are which is beta and the majority of their their, their waking time is spent in, in alpha and they will dip into theta and obviously then delta to go to sleep right. and what alpha is at that age that's where it's a creative space it's a, it's, a, it's a brainwave, which is a, the, the world of imagination, the world of make believe, the world of creativity, the world of, you know, playing with two different sticks and making them you know, something different, right? You're making it a yeah. sword or making it whatever it might be and, and going out and, you know, when, you know, we're, I've, I've always loved the outdoors. I think, you know, growing up in the flat, you just love the outdoors. So when, when, when we have the opportunity and we still do, and especially I think the kids got really tired of lots of walks in the woods, but we need to spend so much time. <laughs> In, in the woods on the weekends and, and either cycling or walking and the kids would you know make dens and play with things and you know when 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 the child is naturally in a state a brainwave state which is alpha right slightly slower state and then you have beta which would then as adults we spend most of our life in and, and beta mm. is a great place for us to be all the time it's a place where you're focused problem solving thinking really analytically and critically now if you try to introduce too much beta into the child at the younger age you create a lot of stress in their life when they're old, when they grow up, right? Okay, because they haven't lived through being in that, you know, the natural way of being, the fifth way, right? Right. right. Yeah. Is and Imam Hamza Yusuf talks about this as well that there is a big crisis in in the Muslim world where you're starting education so young, mm. and so strict kind of this reading and writing and so on at the age of three, four, and five. And I mean, you know, in Pakistan, some of my family there, the, the young kids are like, yeah, just just about three or four years old. They've got huge rack sacks with all these books on, mm. and there's this demand and almost expectations around so much competition around academic excellence and learning at such a young age yeah and that takes the children to an unnatural brain state for that age and development which is beta mm -hmm. now when you then force a certain brain wave set onto a child like or think really analytically and critically and learn these things and learn the alphabet and read and write and start creating more stress in their lives at that young age and start giving them exams at that young age then you're going against the natural way of things, which mm. is ages for allowing them to create their mind in the space of creativity. So when you have an environment where they can go out into the woods and when they can go out and learn about trees and learn about leaves, they're learning for sure, but not through pen and paper. They're learning right. through the environment, their senses, yep. 
right? So when we when we talk about um, our academic, and there's a great TED talk as well, a great academic about, most academics think, you know, the rest of our body is just there to support this head of ours, the brain, and, you know, <laughs> and, the, and the, the brain is the most important thing. If we just focus on the brain, we leave all our senses to, to other senses to one side, right? Right. You know, our ability to to have, uh, you know, we have you know the five senses, right? So we, you know, sight, smells, touch, and yeah. taste. And sound right and how we develop all those you develop your sound by getting in the woods and hearing the birds tweet in different places and different angles right. you know your brains keep firing off different neurons that way and you're, and you're reacting to this calm environment and you're and you know and and now we're saying it's therapy right for children who have ADHD go out into the woods where you can hear birds from single right, right, places right. it just there's different sounds coming from different parts of, of, of their, 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 their brain hemisphere and reacting with their, their air drums and so on and it's like but just being in nature is so important mm. right? Me, allowing the children at times to be in nature, how that experience was was really really important, much more than the results they're getting at GCSE and A level, right? That that right. wasn't. So it's how they how they be and how they become at that age was was because you you're nurturing more than you know. We are not our CVs, right? We're not right. Our exactly. And if we really live our life like that, we're living our life uh, the wrong way around, right? Mm -hmm. We're being, being defined by the result we've been given. We've been told what we are by our teachers that uh, you're this grade, and you live like that, and you believe yeah. that. That's becomes your self-identity. Then you're trapped to that. You can't create a new future no. based on a record of the past, right? You've got to be bigger than the environment, bigger than what you've been right. told you are to create this new future. So, so for me, you know, the 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 children growing up uh, um, in in uh, yeah, despite you know some of the drawbacks of not you know having the great community like we did in in, in Hounslow and Twickenham and, sure. and um, some of the the, the the great other parents I got to meet are still my, my friends and actually uh, business associates to this day um but the um but the time in in, in the school there for, for us as parents and learning about ourselves and learning about children development and growth was was important and um I think the children uh, they, they they might look back and say oh we didn't enjoy that much but I, they, they know I know they probably did yeah 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 benefited as well Wow, so. that's fascinating. So, so the next thing uh, I wanted to talk about is uh, Snowflake, which is this amazing gelato place that you have um, started off in London, has gone much wider now, is now worldwide, I believe. Uh, um, we can say we're global. I don't think we're as, uh, as far as worldwide just yet, but we've got a few few national locations we're going to announce in the next couple of weeks. So, okay, uh, okay. So, how did that all start off? So, you were working. Uh, as a pre-sales consultant, you moved to SAP at some point, right? Yeah, I moved to SAP uh, through 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 um, you know, being referred into business objects. So business objects were acquired by SAP. Yeah, of course. And again, it's like um, you know, it reminds me like when I, with the story when I mentioned back to you when I was um, walking around with a CV going into to Selfridges and into um, Harvey Nicks and I couldn't you know they won't accept me job. I also applied to SAP SAP you know in about second year at um, at uh, Comshare and, and they didn't. Um, you know, didn't get past HR. But once I got in the business, I realized actually, you know, I don't know why I wasn't allowed in because, you know, I'm doing quite well. Right? I was quite respected and I grew my career quite well. So I moved from pre sales into sales when I was at Business Objects. So moving into pure business development and sales, right. which um, for me was like the step forward, the step in progressing my career. Um, love pre sales, love going up and down the country and presenting. But for me, it was being um, the, the captain of the ship was a salesperson, so business right. person. And um, I really wanted to develop that further and that SAP had the opportunity to so so at SAP working business development um, you know and I had an opportunity back in 2011 um, to go out to the Middle East and be a business development person there um, new business for SAP um, uh, to buy and working across the, the, the MENA region Middle East right. North Africa. and so I went out had a couple of uh, interviews Flew out a couple of times, and um, at the same time, an idea was kicking around my head around doing my own business and starting my own business. And then it was a trade-off: is right, do I leave SAP completely, leave the industry completely, do my own business, or do do we go right. to the Middle East? Yeah, there's two options, and I chose the the, the the latter to start start my own business. And that was from a uh, um, you know in 20, 2011. I remember it in Ramadan after Tarawi going to one of my friends. Um, gelato parlors, uh, dessert parlor, and it was right. in, in Darfur. And I was sitting there and I was enjoying this. And it was, I thought, you know what? I was saying to them, I could do this. <laughs> way. And if I was going to do this, it would be the top end of the market, the best, and it'd be in central London, the best locations, and so on. Right. So that's when the inception happened. It was uh, Ramadan 2011. And then, kind of, you know, about November that time, I was like business planning, doing things in financials, getting back to my accounting world, right? Looking right. through 
and then saying, right, how you know, how how can I do this? So the 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 friend of mine who had that um, uh, agile to parlor um, sat down with him and said, look, let's just do something new. Let's do it together. And um, spoke to one of my cousins who's based out in Dubai, still in Dubai, Mohammed Awad, and we we got together and we said, actually, yeah, we'll start this new business. And um, it was you know, the business back then didn't have a name. We agreed about December time. Yeah, we'll do this. We formulated our, our kind of you know terms and like everything else. Mm. And um, we uh, we set about saying right, we want to create the best quality gelato there is in London. Go, you know, for my roommate was doing that. So it was really good looking at understanding bake things down to first principles, understanding how is something produced, how do you produce and prepare this 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 actual thing. Right. And so you have chefs, you have machinery, and you have ingredients. That's right. Let's get the best in, best chefs. The best ingredients and the best machinery. So we're just task on that, spending some time in this leading was up my research with gelato chefs there, esteemed gelato chefs there, looking at supplies from Italy around the, the whole ingredients. And then 70% of gelato is milk. You know, right. so we then set about set about looking for the best milk in the UK. Um, we we settled with a farmer we're still using to stay, um, Ivy House Farm based in Froome and Somerset, and Jeff and Kim Bowles run it, family run farm and um, ethical farm, organic, and I have a Jersey herd. And the cream and, and the Jersey milk is just just, just incredible, and that gives our gelato that real differentiation in in, in the market. And and um, you know we we won over thirty stars in great taste. We were supreme champions in twenty fourteen. So start you know so started our first stop in twenty twelve, and the name Snowflake came about. We had a whole load of different names um, being being put around you know, with different dessert or different gelato something. Or and um, my brother sat down and said, let, let, let me let's just do some brainstorming. And um, he said um, snowflake. And as soon as he said snowflake, I honestly thought oh, that doesn't sound right. And then well, I think about let me say that again. And then we we ended up having snowflake luxury gelato being the original kind of yeah. brand name, yeah. uh, you know, snowflake. And the reason why I went for snowflake was, you know, the pureness of snow, uniqueness of snow. Oh. Everyone loves some snow in the, in the UK, right? Yeah, we, everyone loves snow. Yeah. We, we, and it's it's the charm of snow, the the, the novelty of snow. And um, you know each flake being indivi individual, you know it's soft and so on. So we we love the name. We we registered the name, trademarked the name, Snowflake, and uh, we went about looking for you know the, the provenance and the ingredients. We did that and looking for a unit, and we settled on a unit in Westbourne Grove. Um, we found a unit, and we actually then changed the unit because the subway in Westbourne Grove was up for grabs. Why we were already given a deposit, but the, the lesson I learned back then was um, um, cut your losses. Early, if you need to move on, move on. Right. Don't keep on digging. Cause that unit we initially went for actually was probably too small, and the one we went for, we although we lost, you know, four or five thousand pounds on a deposit, it didn't matter because the other unit was much more ideal for us. We were actually not being able to do what we wanted to do in the smaller unit. Right. So you know, if you're making a mistake in business, just learn from it, and move forward from it. Don't yeah, move, 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 make a mistake quickly. <laughs> yeah, and you, you move on, like clean cut, move on. You know, cut your losses. Don't don't put, put good money off to bad. So um, Westmore Grove was was the first store, uh, great part of London I felt to be in in terms of you know the rents weren't too high, uh, you know we 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 managed to to get some you know great exposure. A lot of foodies would go around there. And this yeah. is pre Instagram days and so on. So um, yeah, we just grew by word of mouth. Back then, didn't even have a website. So we had right. Paolo, our head chef, uh, met Paolo, loved the guy from day one. He's still with us to this day. And um, you know we we have a, a great relationship. And get, you know, it's like a secret relationship is give them space, right? Allow them to to, to be yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, you know, and uh, he's he's that creative genius, right? Who yeah. has lots of ideas about gelato and lots of flavor ideas. And we've done over 100 flavors, you know, together. You know, we've we've travelled you know lots of the world together as well. You know, supporting our growth out in the Middle East and um, you know so on. And uh, but, what's um, the what's your favorite uh, flavor? So my favourite flavour, it's difficult to say one flavour, but um, I love salted caramel and I love the raspberry as well. So the raspberry right. sorbet, so. And the raspberry was um, Ibrahim, my oldest son, his idea. He said, look, you've got to do a raspberry sorbet. And so we, we, we set off doing a raspberry sorbet. We, actually, when we started out in 2012, in 2013, we applied to Great Taste for a whole load of flavours. We submitted them in the Guild of Fine Foods. Yeah. Those know, or Great Taste, the Guild of Fine Foods has been going on for about I think, 28, 29 years now. But, um, you know, Back then, it was like maybe 20 years, and they are the kind of independent kind of food critics, and they have lots of different judges who are either food writers, chefs, you know, presenters from food programs, and so on, trying all these different products that are submitted. 
and in 2013 we submitted a strawberry, a raspberry, some other flavours, and the strawberry got three stars, which is the highest you can get, and only about 100 wow. products got three stars, and about 8,000 products were submitted that year. In 2014, 10,000 products were submitted, and in 2013 we submitted the raspberry, but it didn't have, it was it wasn't de-seeded, and the feedback we got was that um, the raspberry had was overpowered by the seeds, and it got wow. zero stars. Um, they had too much of the seeds coming through and you know, the seeds was getting in the way, which I quite like the seeded thing because like, yeah. like crunch and so on. You know, some people like seeded jam, some like seedless jam, right? So yeah. um, so we then, 2014, developed the recipe further. We, we used to get our own raspberries and go to the market, certain type of yeah. raspberries and Scottish or Kent and so on, and you know, certain ripeness. And then we blend those up with just spring water and um, uh, some grape sugar and some pectin. So really, really basic, simple, mm. three compound ingredients, but good quality in each and blend that together to, to make this amazing product. We submitted it again in 2014 and um, we, we, we were voted Supreme Champions, like which is the number one wow. product, not in ice cream, not in the number one food products for wow. that year, out of 10,000 products that were submitted. So that was for me, take the feedback, yeah. plot it, and you'll win, right? So, so, so. This, is, this is a really interesting thing for me because what you said earlier is something about first principles. And so when you you had this vision of quality and you broke that down and said, right, to get quality, what are the key three things or what are the key things that will lead us to be the best quality? Um, is that a principle that you continue to apply? Absolutely. You've got to always break things down to first principle. You always have to. I mean, and anything we're doing, whether it be the international development of our business, it being, you know, there's a cold chain of how we're getting our product from here to Jeddah. Uh, and now to a few more countries in the Far East and also for small countries in the Middle East, you know, and how do we do that? So you break it all down to first principles. You don't do, right, what do other people do? You right. break down what we're doing here, what is it that we need, what's the customer requirement, and how can we break that down to understand the best process here to, to allow that to, to all, all knock together? So, you know, um, for, for me, you know, customer engagement, store, product, um, staff recruitment retention is all about breaking down first principles. What what are people looking for? What are we trying to do here? What, and you know, keep the end in mind. What the end goal is, and mm. work, work towards that. Right. So our end goal was to create the best gelato in London. Okay, how do we do that? Keep the yeah. end in mind, but then let's go all the way back down to first principles and break that down. What what the composite parts here? Mm. So again, for? just just in your own words, break that down for someone who doesn't understand. What does it mean to break something down to first principles? Just look at every single element of a a, a, um, a product, a service a thing and understand how many constituent parts can you break that down into right. as much as you can, as many buckets as you can break take that into and identify each bucket, each little each little um, building block, you know, so so you know, our gelato, let's say is a whole load of Lego, right? You break out the Lego pieces and understand what does this piece need to be? Where does it come from? Where yep. does it need to go? What's the process in that? And, you know, I'm not talking about complex process flow mapping and so on. Right, right, right. Find on a white, white, whiteboard to say, okay, yeah, what, what the very, what the characteristics of this? What impact does this have on the bigger picture? How this part of the Lego piece, how does it form part of the whole? So understanding each part as part of the whole and then breaking down, okay, if I'm trying to make the best, I don't know, let's say um, best bakery, okay, what flour am I looking at? You know, what right. what, what kind of flour? Is it the Canadian flour? Is it Italian? Is, you know, what, what's what's the milk quality? What's, you know, what what will different flour qualities have an impact on the end products? Mm. And and so you just break everything down and then you look at when they come together, how they come together. Right. So then and, together as well. How they and come did together. you then apply that, that those same principles to the rest of the business. So in the terms of, you know, location, staff, um, the, the the way that the the, the the parlor or the restaurant is set out, um, you know, the seats, the the lighting, the tiling, all of those sorts of things. Did that then come into into more of the business, that kind of thinking? Because you're right, the you know the quality of the gelato has to be supreme, but in a in a complex business like uh, you know the food industry there's other elements that play into things so then did you find that you had to then apply that to all of those other elements i think the thing i realized is that i've got to apply what i can what knowledge i have and where i don't have that knowledge bring those people in right so right. when it came to kind of store selection i had a good knowledge in london you know when 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 um you know what was that what did you play Nick? you know 
some minutes, a few days, you know, I wasn't in the class, we were bunking, we were in London, right? <laughs> you were scouting so out locations. Well, well, I didn't realise, you, know, uh, you, know, you know, walking around Shaftesbury Avenue, Leicester Square and Kings yeah. Road, and, you know, um, all these different parts of London, uh, Edgware Road allowed me to get a good feel. Edgware Road, yeah, absolutely. You know, of, of um, you know, our shops, where are they? We're, we're in, you know, we're in Marble Arch, we're in South Kensington, so place I was, you know, familiar with, got to, to, to spend some time in. Um, and where I didn't know something, you know, bring, bring in the experts. So, you know, one thing I recognised pretty quickly is, you know, Paolo, for example, the expert on making gelato, but we, we break it down together in terms of, okay, Paolo, let's go through the process, if, you know, and we reconstruct something. I didn't accept how he was saying to do something just because he said it. I would challenge him on it. But then reconstruct and take that advice and where you've got the professionals who know something, you know, bring them in, bring them the advice you need as you're growing, you know, and um, just realizing that I haven't got all the answers. It's not not, not anything stored up. It's, it's it's a team effort. It's a collective effort, and you bring in the the the, the, the know how when you need to. So that's the, a great the, the pursuit of that excellence mean that sometimes you have to give up something. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's there's giving up, and for me, a lot of the give up for when I was growing Snowflake was time with family. So yeah. from having, you know, weekends we're we're in the parks all the time, right, or cycling, and where we're walking. Weekends now I'm in the shop. I'm in I'm in, I'm in Snowflake, and um, you know, evenings because I initially started I, when I when we first opened. So the timeline was inception, let's say August 2011. Opened the shop August 2012. I didn't leave SAP till March 2013. So right. I was planning. The opening and this whole searching and the resources and everything else while I was still working for SAP. We got the opening done, manager, chef, the whole team while I was still working for SAP. And then once we knew we were actually getting, yeah, we're going somewhere here, it's not just a pet project. Yeah. I then resigned and, and opened up Soho and, and we, we took it from there. But um, from a perspective of, um, you know, having to give up, I think, you know, time with family, that was given up. Um, you know, um, that was a, a challenge for me back then. Um, you know, really working, I think, you know, all the hours you know, uh, in the morning, doing the banking and doing all the cash flow and forecasting and new site selection and the evening going in and helping out when it's busy. So, or yeah, yeah, yeah. Tech. so the working working was, was um, you know, at the back then, right, this is the focus, let's get this growing. Um, but then coming on to when I was talking about earlier on, when I walked in to Selfridges and, and Harvey Nicks with my CV, uh, and taking me like all SAP, you know, alhamdulillah, thanks to God, I got into to, to SAP through a different route. But yeah, we got into Selfridges as well. So 2015, we were in Selfridges. 2014, we were in Harvey Nichols. So all these spaces, which were like for me, yeah. out of, you know, my reach, I wasn't, you know, I wasn't good enough. I wasn't in quotes good enough. You know, I was having my, um, you know, our gelateria in one of the prime locations in Selfridges. We were there for about six years. And one of the proudest moments for me was to take my dad through the revolving dolls of Selfridges and take him to Snowflake, right? A nice big um, uh, counter section we had. You know, 24 flavors and so on and from there we launched the avalato which went viral the, the yeah. billionaires officer which was went viral was on cnbc so it was great great launches with self which is great collaborations with them as well it was a great platform for us to grow but had i let my kind of you know former belief tell me i'm not good enough you know i wouldn't have been right. sitting with the procurement director or the the, the, the retail or the restaurants director at self which is all the restaurants director you know, we, we, we were welcome into, into Harrods as well. We didn't go into Harrods, but we had an opportunity to, to, to make uh, an inroad into there. And we, we spent time in, in, in Harvey Nicks. So being a non-foodie, going in, you know, leaving SAP, starting Snowflake, within three years, we were in, you know, two top, top, top locations in London, Soho and in um, Water Street, which were all competitive bids. Other people wanted these locations as well. We managed to get into Harvey Nichols. We managed to become Supreme Champion and we managed to then get into Selfridges. And, you know, doing those things and the year after we were in, in, in John Lewis on the rooftop and then, you know, it just grew from there. So within you know, three years, we achieved quite a lot. And within mm. four years, we were like, I think, five stores, you know, multi-million pound business. And, and yeah. you know, and, 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 you know, we just grew from there, really. So I think, you know, a lot of what, you know, the success we had for me was me not limiting my beliefs of what is possible through my past experiences and saying, actually, you know, absolutely, I can achieve this. And mm. then, Mm. so I, I have a quick question um at the time that you left sap and you know so there was six months between launch and 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 leaving sap was that just to cushion your financial situation internally as well because obviously you got to you got a family to look after uh and, and a, and a yeah, yeah, know, month of income coming in right yeah school fees and all kinds of things right Three yeah children and um so it was um a balancing act around 
hedging the the risk of going into mm. into leaving the corporate world, you know, in quotes, leaving the corporate world, and the risk of just um, you know, just completely going onto the boat and um, and allowing that to sustain me, and also to see, okay, initially, you know, we we yeah, we opened a store, we didn't have a website yet. How is this going to grow? How is this going to develop? To making sure the market was was responding. And I, I have the saying that you know a few things don't lie to you. And one is the markets don't lie to you. The taste buds don't lie to you. And your heart won't lie to you, right? And if you right. follow, you know, um, if you follow you know, your heart, right, and and um, you know you make something that tastes great for for, for you as an individual, yeah. uh, uh, the markets will, will will respond. And that's that's what you know. Thank God. That's great. That's a great saying. That's 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 really useful. So yeah, for, for me it was like right. The market, the market. People are going to come in or not come in. There's no excuses I can give. If a great product, people come in. Now, as a brand, we've fallen down on a number of things, and we've we've not been at the top of our game on a number of things. Um, don't want to necessarily highlight them now in this interview, but you know, we we some of our stores do need an update, refresh, or refurbishment, investment into the working feel, the whole kind of you know experience of uh, you know that retail experience or that kind of customer experience needs to be honed in and in. The one thing that's kept us going strong is a damn good product mm. despite maybe not having the best looking shops and despite there being some really grindry places to go we've got a 70 percent typical customer repeat base so 70 percent of our right. sales from existing customers they still so come in for the quality of the ice cream yeah, for the for the quality, yeah. people travel from you know from you know other sides of london to get into mm. to one of our snowflakes because the quality is just really there mm. Mm. and so you 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 continue to be a partnership um how complex or easy is it working with other people in something that you know you feel so uh you know you spend so much of your time with and you have such strong opinions and and strong directives on is yeah. is there is there is there disagreements do you do you how do you manage those kind of the relationships yeah i think like like being married right early on you know or being a parent early on just haven't got a freaking clue like you're working it out <laughs> And you're just working it out and you're trying to just work it out through mistakes and then you know you 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 you'd be graceful and, and excuse each other. Norman Storm and, form. Uh, okay. and you know, similarly with with a business partnership, you know, I've never done a business partnership together. And there's four of us and I'm not the same four of us plus um uh, one other uh, director to join us recently. Um uh, uh and based out in the Middle East. But I was the one who gave up my job. I was the one who ran right. the business day to day, then got on, you know, made 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 things happen. So from the partnership perspective, I think, you know, for me, I made loads of balls ups and, you know, I, 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 um, I'm, I'm very grateful that I've got very patient partners and I think we, we, we learned and grew together. Mm. But it comes back to perspective, comes back to how we engage with others. And if we think we're always right in our, in our angle is the right angle and, and, you know, see, see the others being, you know, because they don't agree with us, they're wrong in quotes. Yeah. That's going to be for disaster. And it comes back to, okay, I can read all the business management books and all the development books but if I can't read who I am myself and develop myself as an individual from the inside out then I'm not going to be the best business partner right because, you know, for anything you've got to be your best self right and your best self you've got to look at how you're going to grow and develop that mm. and that is a combination of, 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 of things you know reading and understanding but also right. practices it, you know you've got to start going inside and understanding yourself understanding what do I react to? What do I respond right. to? My thinking patterns, and so start kind of objectively looking at what do I think about all day long, right? Mm. What, what are my how my emotions are? How what triggers me? Can I can I refrain from being triggered by an environmental thing and so right. on? And you know, start going into this 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 process now. You know, as human beings, we have sixty thousand thoughts every day, typically, and eighty percent of our thoughts are the same thoughts, right? So we typically have. <laughs> 50,000 50, plus thoughts, which are the same thoughts as the one we've had before, the ones we had yesterday. How many do we have? 60,000, did you say? 60,000 thoughts a day. I reckon about 30,000 of mine is, uh, I'm hungry. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, 80% of the same, right? And for maybe for you, it's 90% of the same about being hungry. Yeah. Um, and then also, our brain will record negative things much more than positive, positive things. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, the yeah, reason yeah. why this is, is is from a survival yeah. perspective. So uh, as human beings, we need to identify and remember danger, remember anything negative in the environment in order for us to avoid that in the future to survive, to stay alive. And the survival um, uh, you know, requirement for us to then recall and remember things that are negative have now you know, taken it to the, the, the point where it's actually impacting our health, right? Mm looking at a negative thing or constantly looking at something which is is negative 
um, or remembering the negative, then we're we're living by the hormones of stress of that event happening in the past, and we're replaying it in our minds over and over again. And our body can't differentiate between that event happening in the past and it being real now. But our mind's playing it, and we're still releasing the same chemicals: the cortisol, the stress. Right. You know, and we're and we're and we're left with uh, you know the stress in our body. So, you know, for for me, it's it's you know whatever we want to pursue, got to you you got to pursue what you're about and you know, mm. your 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 best version of who you are is the only thing you can ever become, right? So so when we're younger, we look at you know, actors or I mean, it was tennis players or, or Formula One drivers, I wish I was it and said, I wish I was, you know, we, uh, you can never be anyone else, right? You can only be the best sure. version of your yeah, own self, yeah, yeah. right? Now, how do you do that? How do you become the best version of yourself? That's a great question, right? You think, mm. okay, how do I develop myself more? How, rather than thinking I've got to be a brilliant parent, I've got to be the right parent or the right, yep. you know, show society what I'm doing or the right business partner, or the right husband, or whatever it might be, the right entrepreneur. All of those, the only way you're going to excel, and truly excel, and be brilliant at all of them, is know yourself. Right. Know yourself. You've got to work with who you are. You've got to work by knowing yourself is understanding, right, what are my thoughts? And sit back one day thinking, step back from being stuck in your thoughts and letting them take you down this kind of road somewhere to think, all right, where are my thoughts taking me today? Where in my mind, where, 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 where what are my thought patterns? What do I react to? What, what robs me up the wrong way? Right. When things aren't going my way, when with society, you know, or, or the world, or, or the, you know, the, the, the COVID, anything happens that isn't in alignment with what I think should happen. Right. There's rub, and then okay, am I letting that rub affect me inside? Because if I'm letting the internal, external environment control me, who I am then I'm like almost like a yo-yo, right? I'm, I'm just mm-hmm. I'm high when everything's good and I'm down when everything's down. And if we're living like that, we're going to live in a life of stress. We're going to live in a life of needing more, wanting more, having more. We're looking for fulfillment on the hamster wheel to nowhere, mm. right? And we will never find fulfillment in achieving an external goal ever. Mm. Achieving external goals are good. Achieving external goals are important. Having a goal, Knowing where we want to go is important. Most people don't even know, know where they want to go. Mm. Ask people, they'll say, "I just I don't, where I am now is not the right place. Where do you want to go? I don't know. It's like going to a train station and asking for a ticket. And not knowing <laughs> where, where, do go? where do you want to go? I, I don't know. I just don't want to be here. Yeah. And most people's lives is like, oh, I'm not quite happy where I am now. But they'll think the same thoughts. They'll get out of bed the same way. They'll turn on the phone, go through you know, the WhatsApp, the Facebook, the LinkedIn, the, whatever it might be, the email. Uh, and you know, react and respond the same way, judge those people the same way, react to you know, the things the same way, watch the same news again and again, going into the kitchen the same way, having the same cup of tea or the same coffee, in the same, same favourite mug, sit in the same seat, doing every single thing every single day, those same thoughts, those same actions, but somehow secretly expecting life's going to be different tomorrow. Right. It doesn't year, work that way. Next year I'll smash it. Next year I'll, I'll make it happen. Next year everything will line up. How can it? When we live in an environment where we're just repeating the same things again, yeah. Yeah. living the same way again, having the same thought patterns again, and not making that fundamental change, how can we expect things to change? No, we can't. Right? So, what are some of your kind of daily practices to to get your head straight, to get yourself in a place where you're not reactionary, you are aware of your own thoughts, and you're and you're kind of able to manage kind of the complexities of of, of this huge business now. Uh, you know, home life, your own personal kind of well-being, your spiritual, religious requirements, your physical needs, all of these things. Are there are there certain kind of daily practices that you take in? Yeah, and, and you know, you cover so many things there, right? And all these things have a different pull on us. Yeah. And these different pulls on us, sometimes we pull in a certain way where we feel like I've got time for the gym, I've got time for X, I've got time for my family, or I'm, you know, and then I think just sometimes it's important to sit back and say, okay, what's most important to me now? Mm. As we grow in our in our life cycles, and you know, we have different stages of our life, right? You know, when we're young, we're in our spring. You know, alpha brainwave state, creative mind. Yep. You know, I love seeing you know my children, the middle one especially, was ultra creative in his mind, it's always just playing these games, and he was like being these superheroes and jumping on the Mount Sofa springs and broke from him jumping around. Right, it was incredible. Yep. But, but allowing allowing us to understand, okay, we've got these cycles in life, right? We, we've got mm. us, we've got the youth, we've got. You know, um, you know, when we're in our summer, and we have autumn, you know, whatever that might, might be for each each individual on this journey, and you know, then we have winter, right? And being prepared for that environment, being prepared for what winter looks like, being prepared for that time. Now, 
you know, if, if you're wintering life, there's no point going out and collecting all, all, all the wood in winter. You've got to collect that in summer. Yeah. So, you know, when, when, when you have your health, take advantage of that. When you have mm. time, take advantage of that. When you have um, those relationships around you, take advantage of those then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For something to happen to you to think, oh, well, you know, should have done that then. Just take advantage of what you have now and understand where you are now. And I, I think, you know, for, for those younger on, on, on listening to this is that, you know, as we grow older, when we're 20, we think we've got everything really sus. We've got it sus. We've got it nailed. When we're 30, we think, oh, 20 year old me didn't know anything. I now, 30, I know everything, right? When we're 40, we, we, again, we, we, we think, all right, we know so much more about life. It's not, it's not that we didn't know before. It's that our base has gone wider. Our base and ability to, to comprehend and understand and process is wider. And we can only say that from when you're climbing up a mountain, you can only see the view to the height you're at. You don't right, know. Yes. Okay, or well, as Rumi would say, how can the um, the raw understand the ripe? Yeah. You know, if you're in a state of rawness, you can't understand the, the, the sweetness of the ripe yeah. because you've not experienced that. You've not had that ability to to be able to, to connect to, to, to yourself and the world around you to realize what is going mm-hmm. on. And as we grow older, we should grow wiser, right? Some people yeah. just grow older. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. But, and and you know, by growing my base, I you know I've I try to to balance my life where I can look after my my physical body, look after my family, look after the commitments I have in the business. And um, you know, of late, the family's been taking a much more priority for me than than the business. Not to say that I'm not in the business, but I realise actually to be successful, we don't need to be busy all the time or working hard all the time. Right. The mindset is where we get, where you're going to accelerate, mm-hmm. go forward. So I realised actually hours in doesn't equate EBITDA out, right? Or you know, right, right. Out, right? It's or very yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and we're kidding ourselves if we do. Um, so I realised actually working much more smart in ways, strategically delegating things into the business. And then for me, for me, when I was in, in, in a, the hormones of stress, when you know everything wasn't best with my life, you know when Snowflake was going through a turbulent time, maybe a <clears throat> expansion when we opened the factory, the overheads were, were sky high, and you know we were we were great on the sales number, but the costs were just building up. And you know when, in winter when the sales were down, we're a seasonal business. Mm. You know I get up in the morning, first thing I would do is check my phone and see what the bank balance was and how I could pay a supplier or you know right. buy time. And that was just living in the hormones of stress. So, so what I've what I've since done, and I, I now have as as, as um, a routine is, in, in the morning I would never turn on my phone for at least a couple of hours. So, right. so my morning routines change slightly, but my my standard morning routine is up between five and five thirty, or between five and six. And um, you know, I won't turn my phone on until eight. Right. Right. Before the old me was looking at the phone. What are the messages from the Middle East? Well, you know, when I was working, what are the messages right. from the US? What are the, let me check get that email. Let me respond to email really quickly. And I was kind of like, you know, performing for these external people in my in my world, right, to make sure yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm on it and I'm, you know, I, wherever I've been. <clears throat> and, and now it's like, you know, okay, it's my morning. I've got to fill myself first, right? Mm-hmm. Let's fill the cup. So for me, uh, morning routine is definitely no phone. And for me, I, I, I like to, to to meditate and I like to quiet the mind. So, um by that, when we're sleeping, we're in a brainwave, which is delta. When we get get up, before we get to beta, we will go through theta, alpha, and then we get to beta. And the faster we push that, yeah, the 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 more the the, the, the more in stress we'll be. And if we're living right. in this brainwave state called beta, which is you know, not always stressful, but a focused alertness, and it can become the, the, when you are stressed, you're in beta as well. It's like being in first gear all the time, right. all the time, and not letting go, or not taking time to breathe. And when you then dip into other brainwave states, you have that time to take time out, relax, absorb, you know, just you know, recharge yourself. Mm-hmm. In the morning is a great time to do that or for, for, for bed as well. What I find is, is I'm coming out of, of my sleep state, you know, after my ritual prayers and so on, but, but spending time to quieten down the mind and, and to really slow down the brainwave states, get into heart brain coherence. So there's the Heart Math Institute, you can look it up. It's around how you get your heart coherent. So heart coherence is around not the um, beats per minute, but the rhythm between the beats. Right. And I think some of the latest gadget um, Fitbit fit, fit watches and so on yeah. measures yeah. as well. It, it's it's um, it's your your um, HRV, your heart rate variability. Yeah. So have you got a good pattern 
And when you create a really, really good pattern in your heart rate, your HRV, your heart coherence goes up, and the higher you get it, the more hot your heart is syncing with your brain. And the heart ultimately is 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 the um, it sends the signals to the brain rather than the other way around. Uh, right. The heart was the first organ that, as a baby is formed, and the heart is yeah, really, yeah, yeah. yeah the, the science around this now is incredible. It's all science based, right? So I don't go into to mystical mumbo jumbo. I'm, I'm a science based guy, and um, the science around you know quieting down the mind connecting to the heart physically actually just feeling our heart and feeling that heart space breathing in certain uh, breathing techniques and allowing ourselves to to quiet down the mind to start then observing the thoughts so when you start doing this first when i started doing it first the thoughts were still coming but i was enabled to understand and recognize thought patterns before right. i was so caught up in thought i thought i was the thought and that's right. me and i just i'm running life in the fog i'm running you know, i'm just subconsciously on this program autopilot you just run your life just as you've been told to whatever the environment's telling you to do right, right. Whatever it's telling you to do then you stop and you're quieting down the thoughts are running around there but now you can sit back and say oh that's my thinking oh i didn't realize i you know yeah yeah, yeah, so yeah. Mental, i didn't realize i was over why am i so negative why am i looking at things and then you can start sitting back and reading yourself and understanding wh where am i going where's my compass north yeah where's my thinking now and how is it helping me or hindering me to get to my compass north? Right. And what meditation does is it allows us to magnetize that north, quiet down the mind, slow down, reflect, and then ponder. You know, after the meditation of quiet down the mind, you know, have elevated feelings of gratitude and joy, mm. thankfulness, right? Of, um, of what can I be grateful for? I love I love journaling and and you know things I'm grateful for today. You know people I'm so so blessed to have in my life and so on. And when you can start counting those, you, know, you you'll always have a reason to be ungrateful, yeah. as you'll always have a reason to be grateful. Right. Okay. But you know if we if we go to to, to you know Surah Ibrahim, uh, if you are grateful, I will give you more. Yeah, so yeah, you're, yeah. If you're grateful, you're going to get more. Now. The science around this and the evidence around this is, is, is showing this, right? That when you tune into a vibration of gratitude, you will start receiving more in your life, more joy, more fulfillment, more, more, more wholeness. Mm. And connecting to gratitude is, is you know, if, 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 if you're, whatever you're doing or not doing daily, if you can just connect to gratitude through pen, through, through mental rehearsal, through just taking out five minutes just to feel grateful for something in your life that moment, you'll start seeing your life changing. Wow. And you know, this is where I saw my life change, you know, where you know I had some great insights and opportunities, start some really deep insights. I started kind of developing myself through mentors from 2015, but I really made a massive improvement in 2019, just before pre-pandemic and coming into 2020, where some of the years I had pre or between those stints were really full, full of a lot of stress. Mm. Um, and just pre pre COVID, I managed to spend some time really learning about myself, really going out for a week and, and a retreat and quieting down the mind. And then in March, you know, it was in January in Dubai, and in March we had the uh, pandemic here. And I, I think, you know, thank God I was given the best preparation for this pandemic. Right. And shut down. But I didn't, I didn't react to respond to the environment. And now, us post pandemic, we're, we're a much stronger business, much healthier balance sheet. We're now yeah. international. We opened up through the pandemic in Jeddah. We're now opening up in two other international locations. You know, can't mention them now, but we'll announce them. On our LinkedIn and, and our social media, uh, and really, really glamorous for locations as well, and really great locations for our growth. We've been um, um, given the preferred vendor status of a, a great shopping centre in the northwest of the country. Uh, you know, incredible exclusive partnership for that. And you know, these things happened for me, not because the environment was right. You know, COVID was happening. Our shops were shut. <laughs> I, I changed my state. So as a leader, when you change your state, everything around you changes, right? Right. And, you know, and they say morale in the business. Morale trickles down from the top. It doesn't rise from the bottom. Right. A state a leader is in. Yeah. Everyone in well, the effect, yeah, everyone in the effect. Agree. Agree. So what's the next step now? So, so, mashallah, you know, Snowflake says is established as as an amazing business. You're now going going global. What's next for for, for you? Will you continue to to kind of focus on developing yourself? to develop Snowflake or what's what's the thinking? What's next? Yeah, so, um, you know, we can only grow to the environment we, we we allow ourselves and our minds to grow to. Right. So the more I grow in my, my environment, in my own mind, the more I allow the business to grow. 
So, so it's mindset, right? Uh, you know, we, I've, I've worked when I was in software, you know, strategy software, and, and you know, and software to, 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 you know, represent visual strategies and you know, balance scorecard and all this kind of stuff, right? And, and then, you know, there's always the thing about the strategy execution gap, like right? what causes this gap and what is it? You know, is it people processes and da da da? And you map it all out. It's mindset. Mm. Right? Mindset is 95 percent. Five percent is strategy. Right. So if you, if, if our sum total of who we are. Is how we think and how we feel, yep. and how we act. Like those three things, the three variables. If we're not watching, monitoring how we're thinking, how we're feeling, and how we're acting, you know, obviously we watch how we're acting. We're physically doing things. We can see the results. Of yeah. That. But how we're thinking, how we're feeling, how, what's our mind telling us? What's the conversation we're having in our head, and how mm -hmm. we're talking with others? We need to just say, right, if that's giving me my results today. If I start doing the same thing over and over again and accept, expect different results, I'm as Einstein would say. Right, crazy, right? Yeah, so yeah, yeah. Same things over and over again. Now, there's something called persistence, which is important to continue and persevere. But doing the same things, expecting different results for, for, for no other reason that oh, next year will be different. Yeah. Is, is insanity. What I've realised is the biggest growth I've had personally in my own life, my personal relationships and and, and the relationships that I've got with 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 those around me in my life, whether it be in the business or personal, uh, and, and I've enjoyed. The, the, those moments the most through growing myself the most and the business has grown the most but actually developing myself is a big part of this so so with the board and and uh, the business we've decided that you know training development is really important for us as an executive team realizing that we you know we need to start spending more time on on, on, on you know on, on the executive and senior team on developing ourselves and developing yep. mindset, and developing you know um better ways of being right uh, and not just a skill an external skill <laughs> and um and through that we really want to grow the business so we can then carry more weight. The, 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 you know, the more um, we, we grow, the more weight we can carry, the more we can take this business in terms of its potential. Yeah. Mm. So I want to take the business to, to um, you know, hopefully 20 plus countries. I'd like yeah. to be at the helm for that. I think, you know, once we're post 10, I'd like to maybe step into like a chairman type role and not be CEO. I'm more sure. of a part of guy, that visionary that create the, and not the finisher. And when there's, you know, when we're a big, you know, organization where there's operational um, requirements are much more exceeding the, the, the kind of, you know, founder visionary requirements, then I'd like someone with, with that operational prowess to come in right. and run a huge operation and have more of a kind of a chairman type role. That's the vision I've got and then an exit. You know, I'd like us to to create a valuation in the business, which is going to be uh, a beautiful, healthy return for, for for all those who have invested hard earned money into mm. stuff and trusted me with that, and and allow us to get a great, great return. So for for me, the vision is grow, continue our international expansion, continue the UK expansion, uh, mainly through, through franchise in the UK and internationally purely through franchise. Uh, continue that momentum um, and really grow fast through um, you know, working on, on some great deals some great partners and allow opportunities to come to us to, to, for us to execute well on and create you know for me the vision of you know having snowflake as the world's best loved gelato brand yeah. you know having you know globally you know there is a big gap in terms of the the, the global brands in gelato there's only a few so there's mm -hmm. a lot of space for us to go into that market yeah and then you know and i'd love to to to, to exit to to, to realize some 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 uh some some uh, great gains from from the, from the work I put in over the last ten years. It's our tenth anniversary this year, so we're going to celebrate that wow. quite well. And, when, and you know, so by the time I think you know the company's fifteen years old, I hope that we're we're in um, a place where we we are looking at. Um, and my position is, is is maybe moved on, and, and in terms of maybe a chairman role, or we've looked at an exit or partial exit. Uh, and um, you know, I think you know, my council always tells me run your business like you're always going to sell it tomorrow, but you know you might want to keep it for, for forever. But if you, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah grow the value um you know you're looking at the most important things then so if yeah. you look at the value you're looking at not just today's bottom line but the overall long-term bottom line growth so right, right. Value. so um so that's that's my personal plans uh, um i'm spending a fair bit of time doing mentoring um some voluntary with people in, in uh, you know growing into the sector we, we reached out to me said i'd love to, to to go into you know into hospitality and i'm currently in the corporate world can you help me? And I'd say absolutely, or, or some within mm -hmm. family, uh, and then um, yeah, some some who actually said like I'd like to connect to you and make a make a you know um, you know a uh, a mentoring group and, and uh, you know um, allowing myself to spend some time doing that on uh, which is, I find it really rewarding and really really yeah. fill my cup. So. I can imagine. I can imagine. So um, we're, we're coming to the end of our time. I know I know you've, you're 
busy man with lots lots of other uh, engagements. Um, I have two of my most uh, my favorite questions that I ask right at the end. Can you give us a book recommendation? What's one of the books that you suggest everybody reads because it's affected you in some way? Yeah, Untethered Soul, Michael Singer. Untethered Soul. Right, I will check that out. Let me write that down. Untethered Soul. So Michael Singer, yeah? Yeah, it's about so five I'll, I could recommend, but that's probably the one I, that springs out at the moment. It's on my, I'll tell you what, my mentees on our study circle at the moment. So, so yeah. if you want to send me some other ones, send me them and, and I'll put them onto yeah. the link of the uh, of the uh, of, of the YouTube. Um, the other question, which is probably my favourite one, is what's your favourite film or what's the one film that you could watch over and over again? I don't think there is one that I could watch oh. over again. I get bored of the same thing, you know, just, uh, but I, don't, I, don't, I don't know, I don't, I don't much watch TV, hardly watch TV, man, um, I'm the one guy for films, what's the last film I've seen, what's the last thing that really got me excited, I think you warned about this question, I could thought about the answer, but <laughs> oh, the book is, is there, uh, I like reading, I like audible, audible, I love listening to books when I'm driving into work, right, um, films, um, I don't know, man, I just like, um, I, I should think about that. I, I enjoyed watching The Man from Uncle. That was quite good. Really? Okay. Um, With, um, oh, what's those guys? I can't remember the names now, but I know the one you mean. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, yeah. But I, the time I'm watching the film, most of I'm on the plane. Right. So if I'm on a plane, I'll watch the film. I don't want to be working on a plane and sometimes, you know, just don't want to be reading all the time as well. So so I like watching films while I'm on a plane. But I'm, I'm not a film buff. I oh, used okay. to be. You know, uh, and when you asked me when I was younger, it was pretty Scarface or something. But um, yeah, Scarface. But, was great. But, um, but yeah, but no, sorry, pass on that one. So. Okay, no, so I'm, I'm taking. If I find something, I'll post it to you. I think, yeah, that was a yeah. Post it to me. Post it to me. That, that's great. Um, so listen, I said uh, this has been an amazing, insightful, uh, beautiful conversation. Um, and I think what I will do is we'll get this out, and then and then at some point I'll I'll, I'll invite you back to talk. Uh, you know, just just solely about the kind of the, the meditation and and some of these mental exercises that you kind of uh, alluded to at the end there and that might be a separate thing that we do at some point in the, in the near future uh but i i, I want to thank you for your time and you know your insights and uh, you know letting us into your world and into the world of snowflake um and i really appreciate that thank you so much i think it's a pleasure thank you for having me on thank you sir. take care So that was Asad Khan, uh, and I'm sure you'll agree, a really amazing story, very beautiful guy, um, and has a real deep uh, sense of spirituality about him, despite his enormous material success. Um, so I hope you'll really enjoy that. And as ever, please subscribe, uh, please like, please comment. Uh, if you have any questions for Asad, let, let me know and I'll pass them on. Um, and, you know, we'll hear more from him. I'm going to do another session with him at some point soon. So like I said, uh, please subscribe, like, comment. Uh, that's everything for now. Thank you. Bye.